Hey, hey, everybody. This is Rob Gothier, the ET Whisperer. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I wanted to share a little bit about an experience I had recently. I had uh, an episode and an interview on the Jeff Mara podcast, which is a huge podcast with an amazing host. Jeff Mara is a great guy. I've gotten to know him for the last few months, uh, and he really is an amazing dude. But he had Ardith on the show recently, and I did share it in the community tab. Um, you guys can always check out the community tab by going to my channel and going to the community. I try to share a lot of interviews or, or things that I'm doing outside of my own work and channeling. Uh, but this was an amazing episode, and they talked about a subject that was really great. So I'm going to play a clip from that, and then I'm going to share and talk a little bit about what Ardith says about the incarnation cycle. Now, I've never done a video like this where I've cut in and out of what Ardiff was channeling about and talking, but one thing I've noticed um, with a lot of people who are newer to my channeling or a lot of people who haven't really heard Ardiff or Treb talk a lot, Ardiff can go over the heads of a lot of people or he expresses the, the information so quickly um, and uh, such a large amount of information all at once um, that sometimes it can be hard to keep up. But I also know the encoding of the information. There's a lot more information than just the words that he's sharing. So for me, it comes easy. It goes through my body, so I understand the channeling very well. Plus, I've had uh, many years with Trev and Art at both, so I've been able to really understand more about what they're sharing. And the information in this incarnation cycle uh, stuff is very amazing. And, and Jeff asked this question. It was a beautiful question. So I'm going to just go ahead and play that clip real quick. And after I get done playing that clip, um, then I'm going to go through and talk about what Art have shared, the points that he shared, and kind of explain um, from a human perspective what he means and, and you know that encoded information that he's not saying with words. I'm going to share a little bit about that. So I hope you guys enjoy. Enjoy the clip from the Jeff Marr podcast that was released this Sunday. On Earth, we go through cycles of reincarnation. At least I think we do. Where we take a body and then the body dies and then perhaps we come over and over again. Do you go through any type of cycle like that or are you just existing for infinity. Yes, we do in fact, as we are physical, still adhere to the incarnation cycle. Now, of course, our cycle is different. Our cycle holds physical forms much longer than yours and your own experience at this moment. For example, being third density humans in fourth dimension and transferring that energy into a fourth density and fifth dimensional experience your lifespans now are on average of 80 to 100 years, and the experience will grow in the next 500 years of Earth expression. You may live to be over 250 years of age. Why would that occur? Because you have more to experience in one life cycle, not physical things that you need to experience but experiential things that are required by a soul to agree to inhabit that body. For example, if you look into your own human history, your caveman, as it were, the least evolved form of humans, only lived to approximate age of 30. Therefore, what did occur in that time period? Of course, what occurred what was needed, what was required by that soul was a very simple requirement. Only participating in gathering of family, gathering to survive, creating small social circles. And that was the entirety of the life. Now look at where humans are at this moment, expanding the understanding of oneself, expanding the understanding of the greater planet in which you live in your life, experiencing entire planet worth of consciousness in one life, being able to go to the internet and connect to a human living upon the other side of the world instantaneously. Now this 
is much more within one lifetime that can be experienced because the soul requires evolution. Now humans perceive the evolution that you have as very driven by the physical nature of the entity that you are, meaning that your earth evolves, therefore your body must evolve in order to incorporate and entangle more so with the planet that it comes from. But in fact, it is quite opposite than this. It is your soul that requires evolution, so it creates the new form of human. It creates the new experiences of expansion of social nature. It creates those who are also able to invent and innovate those technologies that open the ability for a human to experience more than one incarnation. So yes, we incarnate in different ways. Our life Now, I just I just want to bring up at this clip so far what Ardiff is talking about uh, when Jeff asked, are you physical? Do you incarnate? We incarnate and we have these cycles where we keep incarnating for different reasons. Do you guys do that? And Ardiff is like, yeah. Now, Ardiff already described earlier uh, about how physical they are, like, I'm physical in my layer, right? Um, I'm just as physical as you are, but we're less limited because we're a higher dimension. And maybe he even talks about that here in a minute. But the idea behind it is that the way that we needed to evolve, we, we can look by comparing. So we go back to our old caveman days and we lived about 30 years old, right? And why did we live in such a short life? Well, all we needed to do was uh, mate, create children, um, have a social structure, hunt, gather, and survive. It was truly the elements versus humans. It was uh, survival in the very earthy way that we do things here. You know, you, you look at Earth and it's a very survival instinct planet. Uh, animals killing animals, animals eating plants, bacteria killing animals, viruses killing animals, um, you know, plants. Uh, some plants here on, on Earth are hardcore. They even eat insects, right? So there's all this different competitive life on Earth. And that very early caveman uh, type of human experience only required an average of 30 years to get everything in a lifetime that a human would need. Fast forward to now, let's fast forward to the 1100s where people were maybe 40, 45, 50, um, and they were considered very old at that age. Um, look at what lifetimes they had. One person would do one job, and that one job would be a specialized job. They would learn uh, how to write, so people would spend their whole life writing books you know, transcribing books by hand. So one person did one job, but a lot of people did different jobs where before everything that anyone could do, one person could do it, right? Um, a caveman hunted, gathered, protected their family and kept the social uh, group together. One uh, woman would have children gather and keep the social circle together. So it was all something that everyone did all the things they needed to to survive and did it as a group a collective energy and then you know as the technology progressed and as society progressed then specialization started happening one person farms their whole life the other person writes books the whole life the other person is a warrior to protect or to fight or to conquer for their whole life some people are travelers for their whole life some people uh, our landowners for their whole life. So all of the things that could be done were very specialized and very uh, and done in a very way. And it took a lot of time to gather knowledge for that one thing. So life became bigger and it got more complex because um, multi-cultural uh, travel started working in that time. So now someone who lived on uh, a remote edge of a desert was able to go inland where there are forests and meet people who spoke different languages and try to break that barrier of communication and do trading. So now we're starting to see this big, big world beginning uh, to, to get a little smaller. 
and then we push forward now where our average age is 70 to 100 years old now we have very complex lives we have social circles but we also have these very specialized things but these specialized things are becoming more specialized just look at science right science was something that people did as a job a lifelong job i would do all things related to science when science first started as an understanding of our world by looking at things and, and weighing the evidence but now you know even even push past that a couple hundred years and now people are in biology and science now people are in uh, physics and science and people are in other fields and now every one field has thousands of subspecialties so our collective group becomes wiser because we have these people that can dedicate their whole life and they need longer in the life because they need to understand more so what he's saying is this didn't happen because we're animals and animals evolve and you know genetics mutate to help adapt better yeah that's physically why it happens but what about the soul reason why does the soul do that the soul does that because uh, the soul wants the experiences of progression on a planetary scale so it can have a whole group of new experiences, right? If you were uh, a human soul during the caveman time, you could pretty much step into any life and have slightly different experiences, but they were all going to be more the same. Like if you stepped into Ardiff's uh, race, they're a good collective. They're all connected. You could go between one and the other and have similar experiences, right? But if you go to the early humans, very similar experiences, having children, um, repopulate or, you know, populating the earth, protecting. And these were all things that everybody did. So you could step into any spot and maybe the customs were a little different, that language was a little different, the beliefs were a little different, but you could go thousands of miles and still get a very similar experience. You know, now push forward to the 1100s. Now you're getting drastically different experiences from India to Europe, from Europe to China, from China to North America, hugely different experiences. So you have all of these different things and the soul wants to experience more. So it creates that evolution non-physically and opens that up uh, to that. So it's not just uh, an experience for the physical body to need to evolve, to adapt better, blah, blah, blah. It's the soul needing more complex experiences, more expansive experiences, and more in-depth understanding. Remember, too, now, in the incarnation cycle, there's different densities that we have to go through. And the third density is the exploring of the self. It's a third chakra energy. So if we're dealing with exploration of the self, it had to start at that local group and community as a caveman. It had to build up into starting to know one person in a field uh, specializing and doing all these types uh, of jobs and archetypes of jobs and archetypes of consciousness. You know, these old deities that we see in religion, uh, it's, it, it's a really good example if you've ever watched Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones has the seven, which is the religion of the seven archetypes. And that basically shows us the, the um, stranger, the crone, the uh, father, the mother, the warrior, these are all archetypes of humans. So when we get into that space, it opens up all these different experiences and that's what we do. So I think it, that part was really an important part to listen to. So let's keep going on uh, the Jeff Marr interview about incarnation cycles. If spans are spread throughout tens of thousands of years and not social nature, it creates those who are also able to invent and innovate those technologies that open the ability for a human to experience more than one incarnation. So yes, we incarnate in different ways. Our life spans are spread throughout tens of thousands of years and not within 100. Our experience incarnating whereas humans may spend 30 to 300 years upon average between incarnations, 
of course there are some that are much shorter and of course there are some that are much longer. But in our own expression, we are able to incarnate either immediately or wait for hundreds of thousands of years to go back into a physical body. Why does this occur? Of course, when you are not in your body, you are still a soul. And what do souls desire? Souls desire experience. So in order to experience in that physical projection into that physical reality, there must be a desire a plan, a co-creation point, a focus. So of course the soul goes into that expansive nature, integrating with the part of your own soul that was not available to you while you were inside of your body, reintegrating into that higher self, repurposing the portion of lower self or personality, part of your consciousness and finding more how to integrate that higher dimensionality, the higher focus, the higher knowing and the higher mind, using that greater knowledge to plan that next incarnation, being able to look upon all of your previous incarnations and see the themes that you have already experienced and know what places in those experiences were lacking and what were fulfilling. And by going through those older experiences, then one comes into that contact of new ideology. What can we experience that we have no recollection of experiencing? And of course, in our own race, being at the very end of the incarnation cycle, all that this means is that our race has experienced all that can be experienced on our planet, in our solar system, and in our physical bodies. We are going through the last part of our own cycle because we are done. And when that is done, what will occur? The next cycle will start. Now, uh, this part just talks about his own race. Um, Ardiff did talk a lot about his race on this video, which is great. Um, he doesn't do that a lot with our channeling. I never force him to do that. And a lot of people are more interested in other things. Uh, so when they ask him, it, it just, he gives different information. So it is nice to hear about his race. But what he's saying is their race, um, they live in their bodies for tens of thousands of years and their sixth density. So that means they're at the very, very end of an incarnation cycle. Now, I don't know how much he gets into the incarnation cycle in general throughout the whole interview. I've watched most of it a couple times, but with the kids and, and everything else, uh, it has been uh, difficult to remember exactly what he said. But what I know about incarnation cycles is an incarnation cycle is the very starting of a, a race of beings and playing that out throughout the whole thing, like through first density, second density, third density, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And each one of them has a different theme. Each density has a different theme. And I know we talked about that, but he also talked about the sixth density being the last one. So what he means here is that inside of their own race, because they're almost done with their incarnation cycle, artist race is like literally at the very end of their incarnation cycle they've lived everything they could live and they can go out of their body and say, okay, this body is done. This personality named Ardiff is done. And the next life he would just jump right back in or because, you know, he's so high into his soul already where we're just, you know, a very small part of our soul. I think in this interview, he said at the maximum is like 20%. Then, you know, they're like 90%. So they only have a little bit of integration to do. And what he's saying is between those lifetimes, uh, what happens with humans uh, and with every soul is that they integrate back into their higher self and learn a little bit more about their soul. And this is where you learn about past lives that have happened, possibilities for future incarnations, and you kind of choose that path. Um, and it was really important too to note that the experience of theirs they don't have a lot left to do so when they go out of their body they're just either jump right back in and, and choose another path that they already know because they've known this for their whole life 
what's next or take some time to reintegrate fully and take some thousands of years to see if the progression on the planet changes enough to have something new on the planet happen, which I found very interesting. So let's go back to the video. Perhaps we will go to a different planet in the same solar system and start living as very fundamental bacterial life and growing into more complex and having that soul experience from that energy. Or perhaps we'll go to a different solar system altogether, perhaps even a different galaxy in that way, pending upon what themes we desire as a greater collective. Your Earth did the same thing before it started from that higher group of soul energy. And what was that greater desire? To master reality in that way, to come into a place where humans are able to experience the entire spectrum of emotion and mindset, to come into reality that holds such vast and great difference in perspective, but being able to do so in one planet and hold the large gamut of experience. This is why humans are very fashionable in that way. This is why humans are looked upon by other races. This is why humans develop in the way that they do. Your experiences are vast and high in the spectrum of possibility that you hold. So the experience teaches the soul at greater levels than other solar systems that have very finite ways of growing or having very low spectrums of possible exchanges and experiences as well. All right, so basically he kind of wrapped that idea up saying that on his own planet, you know, um, that they're at the end and what comes next, the possibility is endless. Um, the possibility of him going into a new cycle means that they start from fresh. Now, he also hinted at this earlier, um, the time cycles themselves aren't perceived on a soul level the same way we do in linear time here. But if you did look at it in linear time, they would go into, uh, you know, some kind of elemental energy and start a new planet or go to a new planet that already exists and start bacterial life. But that would be where their next incarnation cycle goes. And because they're at the end, they have a lot of time to play with. They also have endless amounts of choices. They said they could stay in the star system DNIB where there are uh, more planets and um, moons, you know, satellites that they can go to and start a new incarnation cycle, or they can go through and uh, create their own, like in a brand new forming solar system, uh, help the energy as collective souls and join up with, with whatever consciousness is there to focus on one planet and create it, which is something too that's very amazing. So we're gonna uh, go back to Jeff's follow-up question here. Can you tell us what day-to-day -day life is like in your realm? Yes, of course, first of all, the experience of what a day is is vastly different. Yes, there are cycles upon our own planet that hold day and night cycles. There are experiences of change in one year cycles, but not within one year time span, simply meaning an entire revolution around the star that is known as Dinib. But of course, the day to day life drastically different. First of all, that dimension which you are in. That density which you are in experiences linear time after your own experience in the next dimension above. It experiences cyclical time. And after cyclical time comes time that is fluid in nature. This is where our own race works. We do not experience time in the same way and fashion as humans. We have the capacity to experience being in our deathbed before ever experiencing being a brand newborn entity. Now, of course, this seems counterintuitive and confusing for the majority of humans, but what dictates what time we are in, what dictates what age we are in, 
what dictates, what experience we are within, is dictated only by the greater desire and focus of our mind. Where we focus our present thought is where we experience, yes, much less limiting in physicality than what human experience, much less are we limited in the way that we experience time itself, but where we are in each day is pending upon our own experience. Now, if you're experiencing that of one average 24 hour span, it is quite literally drastically different from entity to entity. But if you were to take our own experience upon our planet and create the only available experience of time to be linear, then our experience would be much more predictable. For example, in 24 hours, I, in my own consciousness, have worked within, staying around groups of entities within our own colony and group, and these are only several hundred of our own race, and we are connected because our souls have worked through multiple lifetimes together. We share common interests, we share common perspective, and of course, we share greater purpose as it pertains to the work that we do within co-creating with other entities throughout the entirety of the galaxy. So as we are the communicators of our race, and we are spending our time together, both in proximity and energetically, we are able to simply sit in nature and our own expression. Now, of course, our daily expression often pertains to music, as it is one of the greater parts of our society. But our music is not done as human music is. For humans to create music, you must either create a form and way to produce a sound, or take instruments that have already been invented and create certain sounds through these. But we are at one with our entire planets of consciousness. The trees that we have are not the same that humans hold, but we do have similarities within the construct of plant life. There are entities that grow from the ground and grow up to several hundred feet in the sky and they have multitudes of branches, hold interconnectivity with the root systems. All of them communicate similarly to your own trees and tree systems. The appearance quite different, but they are also tuned into our own frequency and we to theirs. This means that when we desire to create music, instead of creation of instrument, we simply work with the trees, we work with the wind, we create the whistling sounds through those leaves and branches from our environment. We create water from the atmosphere in order for it to rain, to create sound that produces the frequency of the song that we desire to hear in that moment. We do not do this individually. All of us within the several hundred group produce this together. And of course, all the animal life are singing while the wind is going through the tree, while the water is trickling down, it creates that very perfect symphony that shows you the amount of oneness that exists within ourselves. After this, in my own consciousness, from your linear time perspective, even 24 hours, I'd communicated with Trevor Gidney's race, the entity that Rob himself co-creates with outside of my own consciousness. And I communicate with them through telepathy only as they are in a lower dimension myself. After this, we co-create with a reptilian race of beings who is very upset and angry at another group of reptilian beings and spoke to us because they understood that we communicate with all beings. We do not simply intend or place preference with those who are vibrations similar to ourselves. We hold openness to communicate with all beings because all beings exist as part of oneness that is the universal consciousness. So of course we facilitate the help that was required in opening communications and helping heal the traumas that existed between 
those two races of reptilian beings. After this period, we co-created with humanoid beings from Sirius, etc., and so on and so forward. Our main component in my local group is communication, working with other races and co-creating assistance in whatever way that we can without infringing upon that free will. But of course, in our free time, it is very important for us to co-create with those who are closest to us, both in proximity and in vibration alone. Day in the life of art, if, which is amazing. Again, they, they don't talk about um, a lot of things, and, and this one is very interesting. He basically said a day in his life is different because the way they see time is different. And Trev and Artif have described this before. Humans see time linearly. That means we see from birth to death and we experience it only in a line, like from start to end, from point A to point B. Birth to death, that's our life. And we live it in a row. And the fourth density lives in cycles, in secular time. So their living experiences can go back and forward a little bit. You can feel shifts of time, but you're living through cycles. And, I, you know, because I'm not a fourth density being, well, I am a fourth density being, I'm not experiencing fourth density, but my fourth density experience, I don't know if that's little cycles at once, like, hey, I'm going to start an arc in this life for this thing. And then once that's done, I'll go to another feeling of time in another cycle or what or if it's just throughout the whole life it's one big secular energy or maybe you're just integrating all the cycles into your life living more like uh, earlier humans did you know they lived in cycles they they didn't have man-made time they they lived with uh machines that that tell them time they weren't doing that they were doing it from the nature from equinox to equinox and and from uh lunar cycles of 28 days you know they were living in natural time which was secular time but i think it's deeper than that i think it's cycles of life cycles of of experience cycles of energy which is is cool but you go to where trev is and it becomes very fluid you know he's able to traverse time but there's still components of linear time and still components of secular time Art if doesn't have that. So he's saying if you just took the last 24 hours of your time of my experience, uh, you know, I was with my group of beings that all do communication with other races in his planet, ones that's like a soul group, and they spend time and they wanted to produce music. So they shift the wind on their planet to blow through the plant life to make sounds. They they create um falling liquid from atmospheric energy which creates like uh percussive instruments like you know raindrops or swishing in a lake or what i don't know exactly what they're doing but they're using that to help create sound the animals that live there are creating sound so they're creating symphonies of this energy um with nature that's how in tune they are with their planet he also talked about communicating with Treb and his race. And um, it sounds like they do some work like Treb's wife, uh, Sun Boryitni. She helps other races uh, work out problems between themselves. And they're usually beings who are new to telepathy or haven't communicated with a lot of races. So they don't understand the dynamic. They're very cultural and very um, built into their way. And then they go experience another race and there's all these different things. So she helps them connect and it sounds like that's what art have said that they were doing with two different reptilian races trying to help them clear some old traumas so it's actually really amazing um i'm gonna make another video uh soon with another couple parts uh, from the interview that i found really interesting so stay tuned for that but i really wanted to kind of walk you through a lot of, of what art was saying on this interview um, if you want to check out the whole interview i'll put the link below also, I found out the Japan and Egypt trip that I talked about in his interview. Both of those fell through today, actually. Um, the day after the eclipse, the energy, um, uh, whatever was going to happen there um, isn't going to happen for me now, but there's reason for that. Um, we are getting ready for the channel panel. I'm also going to be in Mount Shasta and stuff. 
Um, I'm also after that going to be in Connecticut on the C5 on the ocean. You can check out anything you want to on the website there. But I did want to say that's how I started off the interview talking about that trip. Um, one of them seemed a possibility. The other one seemed like it was going to be for sure. And both of those fell through today. Uh, but the good news is I'm going to be working online with people in Japan. And next year, I'm hoping to be out there um, with him. So that'll be good. And I'll, I'll tell you guys how that's going. But yeah, um, Jeff is a nice guy. He's got an amazing show. If you haven't seen his podcast, uh, I'll put that link below. Check out the whole interview. And I'll try to make another video about these other parts on there that I really was excited to uh, kind of share and explain a little more. All right, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed. I love you guys. Thanks for joining me. And I'm going to try to be on camera a bit more. Um, it's hard for me sometimes to get camera ready um, with all the stuff going on with the two kids. Um, you guys know both of our kids have a lot of special needs and they do require a lot of time. And when I'm not doing that, I'm channeling. But um, I wanted to do this because I thought it was really exciting. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, let me know if you like this uh, new thing where I take some of artists channeling and explain little parts of it. Uh, if that's something that excites you, let me know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff helps the algorithms. The algorithms have been doing great because you guys have been doing great. And I haven't been doing the Galactic Weekly Challenges. I'm going to try to get back to those as soon as possible. Thank you guys for hanging in there. Just life's been really intense lately with all the trips that we've got coming up and, and all of the kids' stuff. Uh, my son Jeremy went through two surgeries this last month. Um, Lily's been been having some really great breakthroughs. So. I'll explain later. I love you guys. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, on the other side. Love you.